So, friends, uh, thank you all once again for uh, joining today. So today's conversation is on a fairly interesting topic on family offices. There's always been a lot of, uh, I wouldn't use the word speculation, but this has been a, an area of enigma for most of us as to what family offices are. And I think we did have a discussion earlier on how they are structured and stuff like that. But the philosophy behind a family office, once you get wealthy beyond a point, the focus is not to make more money, but to maintain what you are, what you already have, and at least ensure that you, you earn uh, returns to the tune of your inflation. So in this context, we have three very eminent people, people who, who, who run family offices, who advise large family offices, uh, I mean, I say large billions of dollars of uh, assets under uh, control uh, to share their perspective on how the current pandemic has uh, changed their philosophy or approach to the entire activity, what they are going through. So quickly, before we move into the discussion, I would like to uh, introduce uh, each of the speakers, uh, panel members whom we have. To start off with uh, Mrs. Aida, uh, She's from Germany, someone who was born in Asia, works in Germany, I mean, is based out of Germany and works with uh, some of the, the largest family offices uh, across Middle East, especially in Saudi Arabia. And what's very interesting from her uh, bioreta is uh, she works on women centric family offices. I would let Ida do the talking on what exactly that is. And she's from uh, sources close to her, we are also given to understand that she's called the super nanny at work. So let's also understand what that super nanny at work actually means. Uh, so welcome, uh, Aida. It's indeed an honor to have you with us today. Uh, moving on, uh, the next speaker, what we have is a very dear friend, uh, Sam Mehta. So Samir Mehta or Sam as he's uh, called uh, by his friends. Uh, is a man of many hats, I would say, because Sam, of course, uh, he is an entrepreneur. He runs the popular Meta hospitals uh, based out of Chennai. Of course, he's not a doctor himself. Uh, he's uh, ex Kellogg's, ex McKinsey, and holds board positions in quite a good number of commercial and uh, social uh, forums. Sam, he, and he also is a part of a hybrid family office structure, which makes it very interesting to understand his perspective. Welcome, Sam. Uh, indeed, a pleasure to have you on board. Then, uh, Chella Krishna, my dear, dear friend and someone whom uh, I always look up to for any, uh, whenever I'm stuck. Uh, Chella is a chartered accountant by qualification, also an, uh, uh, has done his uh, MBA from ISB. He advises some of the largest and most credible billionaires uh, in India and overseas. He's on the boards of quite a good number of uh, companies managed by large families, including that of Mr. Anand Mahindra. Uh, and he's here to share his perspectives on uh, what we intend to discuss on. Welcome, Krishna. Always a pleasure to hear from you. So friends, to start off with, I would start off with uh, Krishna. Now, what has been the basic philosophy of family offices thus far? Forget the onset of a pandemic or otherwise. Generally, they are wealthy. Ideally, generational wealth and raise the wealth. So what is their uh, logic behind setting up or the philosophy behind having a family office, Krishna, in your experience? Yeah. Can you hear me, uh, Divaka? Yeah. So, yes. I think from, uh, from, from, I think historically, I think family offices are set up to take care of a family. Uh, usually a family, uh, uh, an ultra high net worth uh, family or a high net worth family's financial, uh, legal, um, investment, uh, succession, and perhaps even custodial needs. So typically what happens is in a family, of thing, we have uh, uh, basically what happens is the cornerstone usually in the cases that I advise are families which have certain family businesses. So that's, that's the starting point. There is a family business which is operating and throws out cash or there are certain liquidity events at a family office at, at the family, which okay. cause the creation of certain corpuses. So what happens is the next step therefore becomes one to manage such corpuses owing to such liquidity events. Hmm. So what 
post that is the promoter usually is someone who would be working on a day to day basis with his cfo to try and understand you know how uh, he would be working on large transactions he'd be he'd be used to a certain degree of sophistication when it comes to you know working with the cfo his cfo would in turn work with several uh, uh, you know uh, lawyers consultants investment professionals and when the promoter switches back to his avatar at home and when he looks at his personal portfolio and does not find the sophistication that he finds with the cfo at work he sees a lacuna and therein lies the foundation of a family office they try to mimic uh, in some form or fashion a finance department which is which handles the custodial financial investment needs like a treasury department back home but also aligned with the family's needs and interests not every family is the same and it has got certain uniquenesses so the family offices are set up as an alternate to certain private banks which would in previous manage such wealth etc there was some disillusionment early on with some private banks being led by distribution models so i think yeah. birth to family offices okay sam now you come from a proprietary family office perspective so where uh, you manage your own uh, family wealth as part of the multi family office setup which you are now, what has been your philosophy in managing wealth or at least the families which you represent okay so i i came into this setup because it was uh, founded a long time ago uh, actually it's been structured properly since 1991 so our families we okay. have five families they're all gujarati by origin but unfortunately or fortunately i guess nobody lives in gujarat anymore uh, <laughs> so most of the beneficiaries and most of the principals who uh, share time on an investment committee are now uh, more global in nature uh, all the way from uh, united states to uh, uh, new zealand uh, and canada to paris to the uk so quite diversified uh, we have a couple in africa okay. as well uh, look most of the families when they originally started working together this was in the 70s had family businesses so this was uh, in the early days where transferring money making sure you had plan b in case things went wrong especially for some of the folks who lived in places like africa uh, where you had to maybe migrate because of uh, uh, political tension uh, which was part of at least two of our family's original wealth uh, uh, when they moved to another part yeah when they moved to another okay. yes. Uh, yes. geography and basically then started the business that's where the businesses originally founded themselves and keeping the family office uh, structure was more a reason to build uh, uh, what i would call a moat around it uh so a little bit different to what i would okay. argue krishna had originally set up because the philosophy for the five families when they originally set up the family office may have been to safeguard the wealth right in the early 90s what has transitioned over time and by the time i came into play in 2007 was most of the families had already built a significant amount of capital and it therefore became uh, much more relevant for them to uh what was the legacy that some of the families wanted to leave behind independent to the identity of some of the original businesses because uh, yeah, not yeah, all of the yeah. five families now have their original businesses uh, as or, or even some of their businesses in some case uh, as a primary yeah. platform of family identity uh, so in okay. some cases it was that uh, we have one family group out of the five that thinks more legacy uh, we okay. have uh, so it, it tends to range but for us most of our services are around making sure that we bring alignment to a certain type of asset classes that we look after the family so we don't do all asset classes we don't for example do debt uh, we haven't for the longest time done anything in real estate uh, public markets were only a two year old exercise for us uh, so it mainly ended up being private alternative direct investments Uh, okay. and some of the things on the side for example the foundation work is typically done by the families independently in various geographies get it uh, right. and that worked right because we had a certain set of skills based on what we had in the family office play to your skills uh, and uh, so this in some ways yes. it was logical that it was like a cfo plus but i would argue for our families it ended up evolving very quickly 
perhaps uh, somewhere in the late 90s, the first down cycle to beyond having a CFO kind of identity, more into what beyond you can do and copy the best practices of global family offices. Get it. So over a period, your family office itself became an operational entity independently. That's what you're trying to say. Yes. Beyond having it as wealth management. So moving on, friends, I, I would like to again uh, emphasize the distinct background which each of our panelists come from. Sam comes from a proprietary perspective, Krishna comes from an advisory perspective, and Ida again comes from a proprietary, come an advisory, come an educational perspective. So very interesting story. Ida, if you can, before you start off with the philosophy, if you can un tell me, I'm really curious to understand why people call you the super nanny at work. Can we start off, I think, as to why you are a super nanny at work? Um, so it's just the, the ph philosophy is um, in our office is uh, it was founded actually to enable the wealth owners to control the money themselves. So it's a totally different approach. Um, and this is, you know, over the eight years I'm doing this and the more and more I'm doing this, the more I believe if you are wealthy, you need to control what's going on and you need to have a conscious, you know, there must be a conscious decision and not just kind of, you cannot be a play ball by the kind of things happening around you. And um, so that is, so everything we do is actually what the principles want. So just as in um, background, I have five principles, totally different from age. I have ages from 29 to 75. So different, uh, you know, times in life where you have different uh, um, priorities. Um, I have also one uh, of my older principals, she's illiterate, so she is, yes, she is um, from a very wealthy, influential family, but at her time, when she was um, young, there was not a focus on educating women, but rather to marry them off and have them produce as much um, um, children, children as they well. could manage. Okay. So, um, she speaks a wonderful English, but actually she cannot read, neither Arabic nor English. Uh, okay. So that, that makes it, made it very difficult. So, but still, uh, she needs to control her money. And the, the first thing is uh, to, when you want to control your wealth, the first thing you understand have. So the situation in our office is that nobody has worked for the money. They just inherit. Get it. So they're, they're a second generation. Um, so. And, and also uh, sometimes to understand what it is, what they have. They have a, a lot of, for example, uh, stocks, but nothing they have for other people had it for the past. So at one point, they, they really sit up and try to understand how stocks work and, and um, what they do with it. So actually it was a decision for four of them to not have any public stocks. They only have a stock, public stock because they don't want to participate in this yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so it's not my philosophy okay. i want them to find out their own philosophy so this is, this is so the hand holding is i want them to decide for themselves what they want to do with the money and obviously sometimes they do things i wouldn't agree with but it's okay. not my money so i'm not there to lecture them get it uh obviously obviously i have some limitations so if somebody would go deeply into weapons i would recommend that they would look for another family officer okay um, there's a there's a level so the, so it's not my philosophy is I, I want them to find their philosophy okay nice so you your one of your approaches is to educate your stakeholders so that they are empowered to take their own decisions independently right i think that's yeah. very interesting to come from. So now moving on, friends. So we are in times which I guess, as we all say, none of us would have ever seen or even read in the books possible as to how someone has to deal with a global pandemic. And I was just going through a report by the Camden, Camden on uh, family wealth. Uh, this is a 2018 report which says that close to 40% of the wealth of a family office is from operating business. Whereas the remaining one uh, on the remaining 60%, one and a half, which is 30, 31% comes from real estate and 22% from financial instruments. Now in this backdrop, how has family offices now reacted to the current scenario? Because we know that real estate is going to stop or the values of the stock are down by 30% and because only 5% is into jewelry and art and stuff like that. And business valuations are also plummeted. So Krishna, to start off, what are your clients thinking differently in this market? Or what are you advising them to do?
Krishna, your voice. Uh, I'm not able to hear you, Krishna. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, so yes, I, yes. So as of this time, I think uh, with families that I advise, there is a uh, there is a tendency to first check one's asset statements to see how much cash they hold or how much uh, liquid instruments they hold. That is perhaps the first call that's happening and perhaps a daily call that is happening. So as far as uh, uh, in, uh, families go, they not only advise uh, family offices to keep extra cash at this period, but and therefore rebalance portfolio between uh, fixed income uh, back into cash. There's very little equity selling that we can do if it's taken a hit, etc. And we may not want to impair the portfolio. So therefore, uh, not much okay. equity. But to a large extent, I think fixed income rebalancing is happening, especially for the first time, I think a lot of analysis is going into details are being gone through on what is the type of fixed income we hold? Is it good? Is this paper AAA rated? So what if it's AAA? Is it making sense commercially? Those are the kinds of questions mm -hmm. family are turning to. So I think from our standpoint, not just at our level, at the portfolio level, but even at an investee company level, we would have perhaps invested in several companies. We even force those companies to hold cash and withdraw from banks all lines of credit that are unutilized so that they have cash balances to the to the hilt. That's the first observation that I can make. Oh, so you're even asking them to utilize the unutilized credit limits. Yes. So that's a standing instruction to uh, uh, many uh, uh, family offices, family uh, setups that we advise. We are here. See, some of this is what we do. We advise is what we see happening as well. So a lot of portfolio reallocation at the investee company level is also happening where they are also holding more cash. So there is a flight to cash and that's the only decision that that is currently being taken and a very, very hard look on fixed income is what is currently happening. Further, enormous amounts of calls are being made to investment bankers. Uh, surprisingly, you may think, what is a deal? Uh, going, what kind of deals are happening now? But investment bankers are very busy, actually. They are, you know, today in the event promoters, institutions, etc., want to pick up stake in their own companies or they liked but were too expensive. They are happy to raise uh, loans or credits in this market to pick up uh, equity. So that's a that's a classic family office conversation where within the confines of the SEBI rules or the insider trading rules, uh, uh, calls are in the event the cool off cooling period finishes after the board meetings efforts could be made to shore up equity stocks so i think these are the kinds of conversations that we are having okay of course i can very elaborate. interesting so moving from uh, uh, income to cash i think that's a very interesting uh, i think krishna there's some issue with your voice here even i was not able to hear it clearly just check up with your connection before the next question now sam what's what your uh, reaction to what happening? How, what have you been doing with your portfolio, your family office assets? Sir? So, I mean, we've had the luxury of borrowing wisdom from a couple of down cycles before. Clearly, this is like no down cycle we've seen before. Uh, so in terms of the scale and in perhaps in terms of whether this is a one off wave or a multi wave uh, hit, we have a high degree of uncertainty. See, when we uh, look back at the last major hit, which was around 2008, we knew that we'd come out of the tunnel. We knew that uh, there would definitely be certain assets of us that would have higher value and certain that we didn't. And uh, in terms of opportunities, there would always be a number of opportunities. I think the fundamental difference with this time around is it's almost like people are saying there's a new normal across multiple facets of life. Uh, and I think it's it's the dimensions of uncertainty that make this a very different type of beast relative to perhaps a World War uh, One Two because this is not isolated to specific assets in specific parts of the world. All our assets have some degree of impact. Uh, linked to Krishna, uh, we've clearly moved a lot more to cash. We want liquidity. Uh, we were a little bit fortunate in that. Uh, we even though we entered the public market space about two and a half years ago we actually liquidated most of our public market positions at the start of this year thinking there was going to be a 
uh, effectively bear market coming in after a very significant long run bull market in different parts of the world. Uh, what has been a bit more bizarre is we we've started getting a lot more advice from third parties uh, and we listen to some of them, but we also stop listening to many of them in terms of what we shouldn't be doing. So uh, nearly everyone said you put it in fixed income, right? As one of their first uh, uh, points of view and what we're seeing okay. in certain parts of the world in the sovereign safety of fixed income is no longer so sovereign safe. Uh, so cash, uh, ironically, and especially in, in India, right? what happened? Absolutely. And uh, I mean, after demonetization with a lot of our families, when they were outside asking us what was demonetization to them, it meant they had a lot of old notes and large notes under a mattress somewhere, right? Uh, or in safe deposit boxes, all of that got declared and moved into the digital space. And the irony is now we're saying keep more cash, except uh, it's got to be digital and accessible. True. Uh, so I think that's part of it. I think hold cash for investment is a big piece of our puzzle. Uh, we are doing a, we, we did a portfolio review across all our assets. We did stress tests. We do a lot of direct investments, which is a little bit different to perhaps what Krishna uh, is going through. Uh, so clearly we've seen, for example, commercial real estate having a real battering. We don't know when we're going to get paid. We don't know when we can unlock, but exactly. we kind of know we have an asset. So at some point it will do okay. Uh, that's the view that we yeah. have on commercial real estate. But uh, for example, you take art. Uh, we have uh, some significant investment in art that's growing. Yes. And yes. a so lot of that on, you just said, keep on hold. On that, yes. Right? Because we don't see art liquidity okay. improving anytime soon in the near cycle. Uh, so things like that, where we even have an yeah. art investment in a company, uh, one of our conversations has been perhaps you guys should start scaling down significantly your uh, team size, your uh, uh, cash burn, and just maintain for the moment for longer term. And instead of you trying to even sell some of the art that you've accumulated, just sit on it, right? Uh, this is yes. not a time when you uh, are going to get good prices anyway. So get sit, it. hold. Uh, and ride the wave. But uh, for yeah. the companies that have operating businesses, I will say the families are under enormous pressure because this is like no cycle that's happened before. Most of the families have hired all their people. They've hired across generations. Uh, in nearly all cases, they've probably been the guys who've coached, mentored, paid for the kids' education, right? Sometimes yeah. even probably finance the first house. And here you've got a situation where you're asking some of those people to take either pay cuts or sit at mm. home uh, and defer uh, salaries, which is something that they've never done before. They've never done what in my former life in McKinsey was known as you do a, a paper exercise to cut and cut dramatically, right? We don't have that luxury anymore. And so this is a time where a lot of families empathy and a lot of heartache is actually happening in the field. Interesting. So, uh, either you come from a different geography or uh, so what's the take amidst the people whom you advise on and what's been their uh, change in approach in terms of asset allocation or even their entire approach to the scenario? So we are a um, very cash rich family. So we, we always believe in cash. We don't live in leverage. So that we are, we are very different animals. So just to make it very blunt, if you cannot afford it, we don't buy it. Uh, nice. So that makes you quite of independent from any banks who pull any credit lines or whatever. So we, so we were, and actually we were preparing for a market crash in 2020, but not okay. because of Corona. So we were heavily in cash okay. and we have a short list of companies, uh, we wanted to approach when they were in dire need of cash, because this is then the time when you can get into a lot of uh, private companies in a very private conversation. So, mm -hmm. and all companies we have on our shortlist are uh, companies which have kind of, let's say, key technologies or, you know, a market leader, this hidden champions. So we have a, we have actually a list of 300 companies with hidden champions okay. where we approach them on the principal level and said, you know what, uh, do you want to have a silent investor? We don't get operational. We don't want the board seat. We don't want to be seen because these are families or companies which have um, 
a significant stake, who have a technology leader, who are family owned, who have a long history of very smart decisions. So we partner up with them. This is actually, I copy in that approach what the Swiss family officer worked for with the 2008 crisis. You know, they were prepared for this crisis. Okay. And they had the same shortlist. And it's um, actually, I, it's not my kind of invention. I just copied what we did in the Swiss family office. And the Swiss family office, uh, I think, uh, had after the financial crisis, uh, it was the best year they ever had because they okay. could invest in a lot of private companies. Coming to art, um, we always have also a philosophy to have art as an investment. Okay. Um, and um, there are some, uh, for example, pictures out there. So you, you have to look for a certain things like, you know, if you can buy a Renoir, it is now, that is, I think, a good thing. So we have, we have, um, um, so like artists where we know uh, that they are either a certain age or that you cannot buy them. So we don't do contemporary art. Okay. Um, um, that is that is with two exceptions. Um, so that is that is where we look for uh, pictures. Uh, for um, we, we have a lot of diamonds, color of diamonds. Uh, so we are we are diversified in um, in this kind of real assets. So we have a lot of real assets. When it comes when it comes to our real estate. We always looked at our real estate that it's a so a top tier real estate, tier one, tier two, and that it's very well maintained and very well handled. So it's like okay. and so we can we can have an office building kind of empty, but we won't uh, kind of leave it alone. Or for an example, we have uh, hotels which are closed now, and we have teams in the hotels who go every day to the hotel, switch on every shower, and uh, flush every toilet. Okay. And and so it's like um, so we. Yes, the hotels are empty, but but you know we we don't let just let them just sit there. So kind Get of um, um, so they they are very looked very well looked after because we kind of um, yeah we, we we do not want the assets be spoiled by by being kind of neglected because Get nobody's it. there. Very when interesting. it comes to the key people, yes, our our office is very small. We so we have just three people in the office, and the rest is kind of on a roller We we call in people on a need to. Um, on a okay. need to basis. So we, we never, I never believe in big family offices. I think even if you have several billions to manage, you do not need more than three people. Get it. It's, it's kind of, and a, a good one of X uh, of, of people you call in on the, um, so it's like we are frugal. It's even, our, if you would come to our, come to our office, you know, we would be shocked. Our, our, fam, our office is, yes, it is in the diplomatic quarter, but it is not nothing fancy. So we, we don't believe in kind of, we don't want to shine. Uh, we don't want to be seen. So it's like, uh, so we are rather, uh, it's a very down to earth approach, which also is a philosophy um, that you are the uh, custodian of your wealth and that you have to pay for the custodian. So not, you're not kind of show off of your wealth. Get it, get it. Very, very interesting. So just curious, uh, Ida, now with this uh, approach, what is the yield which you're comfortable with as a family office? Oh, we are very, uh, so we are very kind of, again, frugal. So if we get five to 6% per year, we are more than happy. On dollar terms. Yeah. It's, uh, so it's, uh, that, is, that is kind of, uh, um, everything on top is, is the icing on the cake. And, um, you know, we do a lot of startup investments, or okay. not all of them, but two principles do a lot of startup investments. And the principle is, is if, we, if we invest 10 million in a startup and they make an exit and get 50 million, then they take the 10 million they've originally invested and put it on a safe bank and they keep on playing with the 40 billion, 40 million they, they made. So okay. it's kind of, we, we always have a certain, it's a very, very conservative approach what we have. So it's like, it's, it's uh, um, actually this is one of the multi-generation family offices do. Uh, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's uh, and we don't believe in big numbers. If you come to us and give us something where we get 20%, we are not interested because we don't believe that businesses are, going like that and you don't do casinos very interesting very interesting now coming back uh, to another question which this is something which many have asked when once we put this uh, so i've got a list of about 14 questions let's see how many we can pick up these have come on our whatsapp uh, real estate is expected to plummet now currently deals are not happening but it is expected to plummet now would family offices be more aggressive in picking up assets at bargain prices now. Krishna, what is uh, what are your uh, clients or what is your take on that? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, very much. Okay, so I think uh, as far as real estate is concerned, 
uh, we had a very uh, positive uh, view on real estate till covid hit especially on commercial real estate we were examining at least three transactions uh, but uh, the uh, force majeure clause which is uh, a span works for most real estate companies now or you know infra companies now which basically uh, uh, the pandemic has brought into uh, purchase is something that has uh, upset a lot of calculations in commercial real estate so there is a and there is a general view that uh, uh, not too many people would be working from the offices and more work from home uh, cultures would set in uh, to what extent true etc is, is a guess which all of us have to make but going by the current sentiment commercial real estate is a certain no no the family office will not purchase it unless we get three things a a phenomenal client at the at the other side which is locked in for at least 10 years and you know a yield of at least 8% on uh, on a cap rate basis and most importantly a no force major clause these are three things we look at if it works we will definitely pick up commercial real estate on residential uh, i think it will be more on retirement communities it will be more on uh, affordable housing because uh, we sense that uh, a lot of people may want to move away from uh, you know the ghettos and the slums and you know want to move to smaller houses to have a safe and clean distance between people so we sense some revival in the affordable uh, housing segment and uh, also a revival in the rural segment on housing so these are places which or any place that come in that area either private equity place or otherwise are things that we will look at okay interesting sam art is okay i'll just read out art is considered a vanity investment now would this vanity for the now been forgotten for the next 12 to 18 months it's exactly what we said earlier right that uh, uh, this is something that unless there's an exceptional asset that's out there that has been a long term target a little bit like what ida had said that maybe there was a specific renewer or Uh, a set on a collection you wanted to complete uh, none of the families are asking for art uh, for uh, at least our families uh, real estate sam what's your take uh, now yeah real estate it's quite interesting right so i think it's a similar discussion if there are great assets all of a sudden that are available we'll go back and have seriously different discussions than we've ever had before around valuation because the valuation is clearly very different you can't tag it to the previous valuation and unfortunately at this time so far most of the asset owners are still trying to anchor the valuation discussion to what it was like just before it dropped okay uh, and i don't think i think the new normal is vastly lower than that uh, i mean if you hear this news on oyo uh, airbnb around the world nearly every one of the big what i would call the sharing communities Uh, and you extrapolate that into some of the ones that were more hybrid which were these timeshare kind of platforms right mm-hmm. and the ones that were more holiday homes and holiday resort uh, rental place all of them are effectively bleeding with high degrees of uncertainty when normal looks comes again and most of them were heavily leveraged as well so these guys were kind of like leveraging yes. up to the hilt and uh, basically leveraging either on bank money or third party capital money with high irr expectations and i expect major fallouts on a lot of these so all of a sudden there should be a lot more assets available demand clearly is going to be hyper competitive uh, in terms of the supply base rather than the buyer so this is a clear buyers market supply is going to be right. hyper competitive so yes. uh, i would just reset the discussion yes. right so if you paid whatever uh, x 20 years ago and you think it's worth 20x now i'll go back and say i'll give you x plus 3 and uh, to be honest most of the asset owners aren't even open to that kind of logic but none of them have so far told me to go and uh, i guess uh, screw myself yet nice now either i you looking at any assets bargain assets at this moment or you comfortable staying on cash and see this phase through what are what are you advising your client we, are, we, are, we know that there will be import stress assets you know every day you are we'll just take over leverage we say okay we know we know the 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 tf we look at uh, so for example i would look by because uh, this is for me at the moment uh, not really a market but there are some markets especially in in uh, like Switzerland uh, Germany 
Austria, there will be a lot of distressed uh, prime real estate. Uh, if we wait until the stress level gets higher, because everybody who leveraged, uh, including the banks, have a, a huge portfolio and they need to sell up on one because it doesn't Get it. Uh, you know, work with their, their status. So, so um, they know us from 2008 or they know me still from 2008. And actually, we, we, we got some calls. And then when it comes to real estate, Again, we, we do things differently. We love logistics centers. We loved them before. We still love them. So it's like uh, we love waste management. Uh, so it's not the sexy hotel. So we uh, there is water uh, management, uh, um, you know, facilities which we really like. So the things. No. Devakar, I think. Uh... Uh, so, ah, so Ida is connected to Devakar. Okay, so that's the problem. Okay, so that's the problem. No, no, yes, to WhatsApp. So that's how we get on. So, um, so and, you know, if we look for opportunities and the opportunities um, we get in, um, you know, now the relationship in the family office, because the families need to come to you and then say, you know what, uh, we are distressed and we talk. Um, so now it, it shows how good your family office is not in making money, but how good your family office is in uh, connected, embedded in the system that people come to you and have informal discussions. Um, the things which are going on in the other family office. Get it, get it. So we're still waiting for this level to burst out, right? For uh, get into bargain deals, you still feel pretty good. Yeah. Nice. Now, one thing interesting. Now, sorry, I missed you on that, uh, Iba. Hello. The banks have not started calling. Okay, so the banks have not yet started the distress call, so we're waiting for those calls to come into plunge. Nice. Yeah. Now, uh, one thing is generally in a multi generational family office, there's always this rebellious faction which wants to move out and have their own way. And that you would see such noises getting a lot more uh, louder when scenarios of this happen. Do you see, or at least in your experience, have you come across people who are now making this as an opportunity to take their relevant stake and move out of the family office? Krishna. Yeah, can you hear me? Krishna, yes. Can you hear yes. Me? Yeah, so I think yes, there's a, yes. there, are, there are two kinds of concerns, I mean, two kinds of issues that the, the next gen bring up always in a family office setting. One is, of course, uh, they believe that their interests and their alignments are different from those of the senior members of the family. Therefore, they may be more keen that the family office, I mean, that the business itself, for example, the operating businesses take a certain uh, uh, line. But what actually happens is the operating businesses are generally highly professionally run. And the, fa the second gen and the third gen, by the time they come up to the levels of it takes more years. So that's why the family office actually is useful because it helps uh, the younger generation pursue things that board at an operating company would never perhaps permit. It uh, gives them that flexibility at a family office level to pursue, say, passion, pursue, say, separate interests, subject to the most important fact that it's not competing with the operating business. So anything that not competing is clear, clearly and carefully analyzed. And if it's a very good opportunity, good governance, in fact, demands that we present the proposal to the board, get it declined by the board, if at all. And then the youngsters do get a say in terms of where uh, they want to invest and they're free to do it. But nowadays, the, the younger generation all have another angle to it. They, they are even looking at things, especially COVID, pre-COVID, whatever. How can, I, how can I have more of my assets abroad? So that is something that is a big part of the conversation because most generational, uh, senior generation people prefer that assets are domiciled in India. It's more the home jurisdiction controllable. Yeah. They're not very comfortable with the angle of you know uh, monies lying uh, millions of I mean thousands of miles away, and they would rather have it here easily accessible, 
uh, you you know and uh, whereas the younger generation believes a they believe not just from a foreign investment perspective they also believe in an immigration perspective get it gives me a greater ability to be global in my travel capability that is something that's truly weighing on the next gen and is my passport valuable does it give me the capability to be global and what are those benefits does this government give me an international mnc uh, umbrella uh, treaty like what singapore does so these are questions that the youngsters bring to the table which the senior generation do not usually dismiss because these are very serious points that are discussed at a family level and then the right decision is taken based on you know uh, some families take a view listen you are free to do what you pursue and they welcome investments abroad then businesses investments are tailored accordingly abroad uh, yeah, yeah. there is a big uh, restriction on passive investing abroad which is not permitted but still uh, promoters do invest in hard assets abroad which kind of finds permissibility okay now ira coming back now given the fact that you advise women only stakeholders do you have succession issues of course they have children yes so is, uh, we have we have no succession issues we have succession fights okay uh, because uh, um, the thing is um, you know it's it's a part of what patricia said and it's always i think every new generation has has an uh, idea what they want to do with their life and and you know we all have been rebellious at one time i think get it get you it you know my if you ask my parents i think they would say the same but the thing is so we so the thing is ownership and the thing so um the principle is the owner and the, the rest is the successor not access to the money like being some clean money to put their point or to their own uh idea they want to invest to make money but at the end the, the young generation depending when you transfer the funds when when you and if you do if you do at all you know sometimes it's better to put it in a trust and keep them in a very tight lead because okay. uh, uh, some not everybody not everybody is uh, by let me say character uh, um you know um, a good uh, person to handle money um so we look we look a lot of in the personal development and the character development um and then we look a lot of um at the next generation that they find a purpose in life and the purpose is not being rich the purpose is is kind of uh, so we look for beyond being rich get it uh, get it and and this is so there we work a lot and try we really find out that but also to find out their let me say the darker side they have so if okay. they are spoiled children hmm. um then you cannot expect them to be responsible investors uh, you know one contradicts the other so if you spoil them they will never be responsible investors and if you have spoiled them you need to fix it at hmm. one point before you can give them money otherwise they will be like spoiled children yeah yeah yes interesting sam well, what's happened what's the scene in the scenario you manage do you find rebels now raising their voices in this moment or how is it yeah so i actually don't think about it in the same way partly because we are a multi generation family office right we're moving third to fourth uh, in the current climate we have family investment committee members in the uh, second third and observers in the fourth but no actual live participants from a decision making point of view yet uh, so i think across generations if you look at perhaps uh, i go and ask my second generation and if any of the first generation leaders were alive i'd probably want to go and the answers i get is we want you to we want to have a life of values right we want uh, uh, the uh, things that truly matter we like those things to be around us whereas if i talk to the latest generation that comes around it's probably i want experiences around the world it's more around the experiences the freedom the choice uh, and a very different kind of conversation that they are interested in relative to group 1 and if i ask the piggy in the middle what they want most of the time they'd say peace of mind between the two uh, <laughs> but actually uh, i i don't think it's quite that simple so let me take uh, a slightly different way of answering this it's not if you make it a fight it will become a fight and i don't think uh, so we don't have the same uh, reality of eda where 
uh, we tell the next generation of families in all five families because we know each other we've grown up in many cases alongside uh, i look at some of them as my uh, nephews and nieces like our own it's not viewed as uh, a pain in the ass somewhere and that by the way used to be the opinion i had maybe 3 4 years ago i still thought that there was some uh, fundamental pain in the asses uh, what has been interesting is through covid the amount of noise that has been coming in from all sides has been high right uncertainty is high uh, i think clearly a lot of the guys in the middle uh, and even the younger generation which is what has surprised us a lot is they don't want their older generations to die during this crisis they want the right way of saying goodbye if they had to uh, and definitely some of the participants in the group are at the wrong age with the wrong medical conditions through this so uh, i think the uh, a lot of the ownership so if i i mean we see these videos in miami and uh, california and other parts of the world which i would call a lot of stupid people around right uh, whether it was folks of ours i give you the best example we have some family members in the uk uh, and when they saw they themselves saw the pictures of all these guys in bars uh, one of the younger generation members came back and said you know i'd rather volunteer my time in hospitals uh, mm. and i think that meant that we have been slowly winning the fight rather or the war as the saying goes rather than losing it because uh, if your values are good the decision making when it truly matters during crisis gets improved yeah. uh, i don't think today is about not listening today you have to listen more so the reality is i'm on more calls talking more one to ones even doing some coaching and counseling to some of the seniors and juniors because some of the seniors obviously don't want their next generation sacrificing what they call the best of their lives for them and yet i look at it i don't think this is that discussion yet right i think this yeah. is not one where you have to choose the top 5 people from a family to get on a plane to survive i think rather you probably all can survive if you all take uh, logical steps uh, what has been particularly tough i think for all the families is uh, a lot of the generations are spread across the world yeah. and therefore Uh, how do you bring them together in what i would call uh, useful or mindful manner uh, ways has not been all that easy no. zoom or uh, most of these meeting whatsapp facetime only go so far uh, what perhaps once used to be the time that i could jump on a plane uh, jump into a car and make a trip across europe or uh, get to the person there that doesn't exist yeah, so yeah. i think uh, the free of office structure that we have is actually quite helpful today because we can actually leverage on families closer to the uh, specific folks so for example i can go and which i have done uh, checked in on a member of one of our families that is in the uh, first generation uh, but is not a beneficiary just to check in are they okay so the right? issue is we don't see rebellious voices now but the families are only getting closer at this moment i i mean that's the hope uh, true test okay. i don't think is yet that's okay. what i would actually It's frame i think we haven't come to the true test get because it. we're not asked who are the top who are the five getting on the plane right get it get it get it uh, i hope you don't get there but yes so moving on uh, it's a uh, it's a question from sundar on what happens to pa- investments in passion assets like clubs and sports clubs and teams I- i'm sure uh, uh, one of krishna's uh, uh, clients is one of the larger larger investors in this space so what happens to those investments are follow on investments coming up or they're all put on hold so yeah so i can't specifically answer on kabaddi because it, uh, because there is an investor interest in it but i mean there is an uh, interested client in it but overall passion i think uh, it does not matter uh, if for example even if you take the case of kabaddi uh specifically if you look at it kabaddi is a rural sport okay and uh, if you look uh, uh it ultimately uh, this year the best performing uh, uh tv channel uh, which is the fastest growing tv channel is actually a a, 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 a tv channel called dangal which has uh, made close to 350 400 crores about 
60, 70 million dollars of uh, close to 60 million dollars of uh, ad revenue. I mean, the others are there, but this is a newcomer. He's uh, he's made it big. And why did he do it? Because of the fact that he is on DD Freedish. DD Freedish is India's largest platform, which reaches about 30 million people. Almost all of them are in the villages. So a kabaddi or a sport like say, uh, you know, something similar uh, moves then from being passion to something that's more commercial because then actually reach is today valuable. So instead of looking at it as just a passion or whatever, it also is now a question of, for example, if you look at a contest like uh, the India's strongest man contest or something like that, there is, it may look passionate, but there's a lot of demand for that kind of content, what they call the info, uh, uh, infotainment uh, content. Mm -hmm. So uh, slowly the passions may come on to mainstream businesses in a few years. That's what I feel as a trend uh, going okay. forward. Okay. So, so in your case, as much as it is called a passion investment, there is an economic uh, consideration behind it at the end of the day. Uh, I mean, there is, a, it's obviously passion for the Kabaddi sport, etc. But at the end of the okay. day, passion and everything else also has to make sense in the long run that is how uh, i would view it okay okay nice so now either coming back given the world in which you come from uh, the world of uh, swiss banking and uh, opaque trusts uh, are those still in in vogue or are these an option for family offices to protect assets from the younger generation, at least the older generation, let's say, wants to keep aside a 20, 25% you know, or whatever be the number um, into trusts or assets which are non-traceable. Is that something which is being advised as a solution? Uh, Not really. So for us, it, I, it, the, the people you have. So for example, if you have, um, if you have money from one generation to the other, the only reason you make it opaque for the, you know, for the new owners, for the, for the heirs is to protect them uh, from the money because they cannot handle it. But I think it's much more important to prepare the heirs uh, that they can handle the money. And then the, I'm not a big fan of trust and all this kind of uh, structures because um, the, the more uh, you kind of try to hide the money, the more people are involved. Uh, I actually don't trust. I don't trust people who do opaque things. It's, hmm. it's, it's, it's as simple as that. You know, really people who know how to manage money or to evade taxes. You know, like it doesn't make it doesn't mean that you pay all the taxes you uh, you have to pay because there are legal ways to avoid tax payment. But you know, everything where it gets shady. I, you know, we don't we don't work with people like that. We don't want the structures because they attract a lot of negative energy. So we have a lot of focus on really see the true character of the persons. And you know, I'm not sure who has children, but you know, you just see from your children a side, and but you don't you, you never know people really. But you see, but you must be sure that that what you see is good, and you must also be sure that how you brought them up is 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 a good person with a good value set because then they attract the right people and the right advisors. You know, coming nice. back to my example, if you have a spoiled child, you know, do you think the spoiled child is attracts, you know, the really good people? Because mm -hmm. good people don't want to be together with spoiled people because they don't add any value. They don't give good energy. They don't, they don't um, fill your, your, your time or they don't inspire you. So, um, when it comes to and the, the the more money a family has, the more you have to look at um, actually what Sam is doing. You have to uh, prepare the next generation, and you have to lead by example. You cannot ask your children to do something while you are kind of go berserk and 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 uh, do things which don't have a value set. And and uh, you know, I have children. I tell you, it's it's not easy to be a good example all the time. True. It's, it's true. like you know, it's 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 like it starts with with your table manners when you have children. You know, you have to have your secret uh, kind of meals in front of the television when nobody's at home. But obviously, when you have smaller children, you don't. You don't teach them, you know, table manners and then say, oh, mommy is older than you. Mommy has her dinner in front of the TV. You, you can't, you know, so it is, it's all about this, this leadership thing and, and leadership. It's much more, it's much more about, um, uh, you know, integrity. It, it's much more about uh, um, 
that you know what person you are, that you know which, which, what person you surround yourself. And then you make better decisions because if you are a better person and you are not perceptive to greed and ignorance and, and bragging and, and flattering, um, then it, you are kind of immune against people who flatter you and, and, and uh, try to manipulate you to do things which are not good for you or for others. Get it. So, Get um, it. So uh, when it comes to next generation and how you kind of package the wealth uh, to bring it and preserve it, you have to involve the next generation and you have to make it in a way for the next generation. So as I said, if your next generation is incapable, you have to have a trust fund, which is, uh, you know, which is bulletproof and cannot be broken. Um, if you have, uh, if you want to prepare, uh, you have young children, you want just to safeguard it in case it happens something to you while they are young. Then you put, you know, uh, custodians into place, but uh, people you trust. And um, I, I could say, for example, for our will, our will is quite open. So the guy who's executing our will, we had a long conversation with this person. We had five hours conversations. We understood what we want, but we gave him the freedom because we cannot foresee the future. Yeah. If I write in this will today something, and when my kids are small and and I go down to the plane tomorrow, not likely, but you know, when the planes are flying again, <laughs> uh, but and then I don't know the situation. So it needs a certain flexibility, but I feel quite comfortable. And this is what we did for the other principles as well. And, you know, we feel comfortable with the people we have in the game. Get it, and, get and, it. That, and this people who are, will be mm -hmm. then kind of there, they will, they are flexible enough and integral enough to handle any situation which might be pop up. Nice. No, extremely well said. Uh, now, Krishna, is that something which you see happening in Indian families where a portion is kept uh, outside the apparent purview of the next generation? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I think uh, no such deliberate attempt is made. Uh, how generally operating companies uh, uh, do have shareholders who have uh, a kind of... Uh, uh, an approach where the parents bequeath uh, shares to the children and uh, generally uh, at a family office level uh, very very rarely are requests for partitions of assets taken only as I mentioned earlier uh, uh, the requests come in the form of an, a separate investment uh, application or a geographical diversification now having said that securing such assets generally happens when uh, it, it also depends in india we do it, we do it based on the family structure for example uh, if the number of branches of the family are very uh, are uh, are too many like more than say two or three then it, uh, that is there are cousins involved there are many stakeholders involved then there is a there is a tendency to preserve one portion of the wealth for the seniors and then distribute such portions are either in the form of preferred uh, shares which give them frequent dividends or in the form of uh, you know management uh, fee etc which is paid to seniors in the family so they do get their mistake sorted out so that happens when the they're not too sure with a single son daughter a new uh, a family that's controlling businesses we don't need that structure but with multiple cousins etc that structure comes into place get it now, sam uh, i think i'll just take the last question our family offices loosening their purse strings for charity in the wake of COVID? Do you so, see a larger allocation to charity at uh, moments like this? Uh, what's your take? Yeah, so as I said, our family offices never used to do uh, the charitable yes, work through. Charity. We've been asked. Uh, I mean, we, we have been asked and we get obviously the number of approaches that are coming in inbound has increased disproportionately. Okay. What was interesting is we've been asked to do some specific searches for uh, some of our family members that we then share back to the families, right? Uh, especially the ones in different parts of the world, they wanted us to check in on uh, some of the opportunities that there are perhaps locally where it's closer to home. Uh, but, you know, on the whole, I we aren't looking after it. We aren't keeping track of it. So uh, I wouldn't know. Okay. Uh, uh, Ida, what's your take? Uh, are your clients now uh, moving a larger allocation towards charity in the wake of what's happening around? Yeah, 
that is and and we we believe strongly this charity so our philosophy is that charity always starts at home okay so we we uh, it's it's really um, local and grassroots uh, and there you can see the effect so be it that you kind of uh, finance the the um, food bills for um, the 100 families in Riyadh you know it's kind of it's it's not so it's not paying out in uh, in really where you see that the, that the rubber hits the ground or you know all your servants you know you make sure that that their and their ecosystem are taken care of and and there's a, there's a lot of demand because a lot of people lost especially you know they a lot of people lost their jobs it's, yeah, it's kind of uh, they, they just need actually they need food mm, they, they don't mm, need mm. kind of uh, it's so it's it, so yeah there's a there's a lot more and and obviously uh, we have the discussions that that i really encourage them all of them as 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 they you know all of them need encouragement to really look at that and and have an open eye and an awareness what's going on around them uh, and and help to um give you know relief but but yeah. not giving to charity uh, we never we never gave because my my philosophy with charity is really it starts at home it starts local and when you have fixed the local problem and the problems at home, then you can donate to uh, the giving pledge or whatever. Get it, get it. Uh, uh, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not in this headline charity at all. Nice, very nice. Krishna, what's your uh, experience been so far? Uh, no, Krishna, we, we're not able to hear you. I think, uh, yeah, during COVID, definitely there's been some stepping up. Uh, uh, the family office does not do it directly, but identifies uh, organizations on behalf of the families. And uh, definitely there has been a step up uh, prior to it. Of course, this, uh, uh, generally what happens is uh, the uh, investments uh, in, uh, in uh, you know, Section 25 companies like, you know, nonprofit companies that happens independently and gets managed to the family offices. And of course, uh, charity is done uh, directly through trusts. So generally as a family office, we don't manage trusts. Okay. Okay. Nice. Uh, so thank you, friend. I just, I just want to wind up with a quick concluding remark from each of you for 30 seconds, starting with Sam. Can you just, what are your thoughts on how family offices are meandering through this crisis quickly in 30 seconds? Uh? No, I, I think most of us are going to be patient. We'll hold on to cash. Uh, I think there is a, a timeliness of an opportunity that needs to come in. Uh, it's too early in the cycle of what I would call uh, uncertainty. Uh, we don't know what light at the end of the tunnel looks like at the moment. So why deploy uh, a significant portion of the reserve cash into opportunities so early? We do need uh, the market to uh, psychologically come to terms with the new normal and therefore new valuation, uh, what I would call anchor effects. Uh, so I think if you're a family office and you're on the right side of uh, holding capital, uh, so the investment cycle, I think stay safe. If you are on the wrong side, find good friends now. Okay, nice. Ida, your thoughts, your concluding remarks? Uh... It's, uh, so for family officer, I can only echo uh, Sam. You know, you have to now, um, you are relying on what you have built up before. So it's like, so whatever you have built up before uh, is now needs to kick in. So if you have not started, it's like, as you say, you know, uh, if you don't have a network now, uh, then doesn't it doesn't make any sense to build it up. You know, a network is a net where you can which catches the ball. And when it comes to the the assets, so we are we are very um, aware um, what's going on around us. As I said, we have a shopping list of companies we are uh, want to invest in. So we we make them aware that we are there and we know about them and we make make them aware about us that if they, for example, need cash. Or silent shareholders that we are, we did all due diligence already. We have them on a short list, and then um, you know look for assets. And I think it's also a time where especially wealthy families should not um, try to get too much uh, assets uh, um, kind of from other people who are desperate and distressed. I think it's it's now a time to be very fair, uh, also to the people who are. Just I think this fairness uh, is also a value you should have as a family office. That, yeah, yeah. You know, don't run around and see all the people who are kind of breaking down and the companies are breaking down now and then grab it up for you know, pennies. Uh, you know, whatever it is, if you are on the, on the, on the powerful side and we are a, a cash rich side, 
uh, I think what you do to others will be done to you. So I'm very spiritual with that. And it, it still needs to be a fair approach. Yes, maybe with a, with a lower valuation, but the fairness, if you are in a much smaller position, the stronger your position is, the more fair you have to be. Nice. Extremely well said. Uh, thank you. And Krishna, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, so I have some quick thoughts. I think that, uh, as I pointed out earlier, move to cash. Secondly, I think there's going to be a tremendous uh, uh, look at uh, rural industries. Uh, I think that's going to be something that we're going to look at because they've they've been isolated by themselves. They, it seems to be something, the de-urbanization is something that we're going to focus on and look at models that support that. And lastly, I think uh, there is going to be post this crisis an emergence of all valuations with something called a COVID premium. How much were you affected and how resilient are you to even a pandemic? If you can beat this, you can truly beat anything. So I think that premium will be factored into valuation and those assets are going to be of paramount importance. That's what I see. Very nice. Very nice. I think it's been an extremely intriguing and absorbing conversation, uh, friends. And thank you one and all for uh, participating. You're, you're, you're fantastic as a moderator, I must say. No, no, I mean, thoroughly enjoyed the conversations here. I mean, very intellectual. I'm very surprised, Krishna. You haven't asked him when he's going to open his own family office. No, no, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure definitely you three would be the first ones to know that. So if at all that happens. So let's see. I mean, God's grace. And hoping to have you all guys uh, sometime in the near future on a different area of relevance. Thank you all once again. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Have a great. Stay, stay safe and healthy. Bye. 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 <laughs>